His eyes transfixed upon her as she unpacked her checkered blanket from a large wicker basket. It was noon, and the heat of day caused her skin to glisten as she carefully spread the covering out across the ground. He smiled. When her hair held back by a silver ribbon came unraveled and fell across her face, forcing her to swipe it back behind her ears. She noticed his attention and smiled back as if to correct his thoughts. Replying by helping her with the blanket, the two of them finally succeeded in spreading the throw into a recognizable square. The year was 1951. The location was Cave and Rock, Illinois. When his family farm had been devastated by the Shawnee Town flood of 1937, he was only 15 years old. Struggling to make ends meet, his big break came when he learned that the shipyards of San Francisco were looking to hire men with little experience to build liberty ships for the war effort. So, with a newfound independence, he packed his bags in the fall of 1943 and made the long trip west. What he left behind, though, was a relationship that he thought would be long forgotten. But, when he returned in the latter part of May, the 17-year-old girl he had left behind greeted him when he stepped off the bus. Now at age 29, he was back with money in his pocket and a new outlook on life. And the romance of his teenage years had returned to welcome him home. It's nice to have you back, she said softly. Yeah, it's great to be back, he replied. Reaching for a little aluminum box, she opened the lid and pulled out a small black bottle. Soda, she asked, holding it out to him. Thanks. She popped off the top and handed the bottle to him. Placing it to his lips, he tipped back his head and took a long drink leaving only a swallow behind. You were thirsty. I guess so, he said, turning his face away from her and looking out over the river. It was odd, he thought, to have her near again, to be having this picnic in the same place where they had played as children. As she laid out the food, a feeling of emptiness came over him. He knew he should be helping instead of taking in the scenery. Here, let me help you with that. Reaching for the basket, he pulled it near him and grabbed hold of a pie tin wrapped in several layers of newspaper. Placing the tin in front of him, he began to remove the paper as a curious child would remove the paper from a Christmas present. No, no, she said, waving her finger. That's dessert. What is it, he asked, your favorite, or at least it used to be, custard pie. He smiled and carefully molded the paper back into shape. Looking once more into the basket, he eyed a large bowl with a lid. Is this okay, he asked, holding it up for her to see. Yes, just set it down there. The lifting of the lid from the bowl revealed a cluster of white dumplings swimming in a murky broth. He plunged his finger into the liquid, retracted it to his mouth, and savored the flavor. Mmm, that's good. Don't do that, silly. Use a spoon, she demanded, laughing and shaking her head as she watched him obey her command. With his mouth boiling over with dumpling broth, she reached for a napkin and dabbed at his chin. You know you're making a mess, don't you? Yes, he replied, with his mouth full of dumplings, but it's a good mess. Watching him, it occurred to her that the boy she once knew was grown up. He had been in a part of the world that she could only imagine. Her only access to California was what she saw at the local theater, but the stars of Hollywood were no match for the pain and suffering inflicted by the war. 
When she received word from her friend Mary that he was coming back home, she nearly lost consciousness. Years had passed without hearing from him, and a prayer was lifted toward heaven in which she thanked God for sparing his life. As the day moved along, they found themselves resting on the bank of the river under a sky of thick black clouds. The smell of fresh soil permeated the air, and the wind began to blow violently from the south. It's going to rain soon, he said, turning his head to look at her. She looked stunned, but then she smiled. I'm really glad you're home. As soon as she made the sobering comment, a loud clap of thunder echoed in the distance. Come on, let's go to the cave, he said. Running for the blanket, they scrambled to gather up the items now laying precariously where they had left them. As they were cleaning up, heavy raindrops began to fall from the sky. A tree from atop the cliffs gave way, crashed to the ground, and caused her to be frightened. Go to the cave, he shouted. I'll take care of this. From the safety of the cave, she watched as a sheet of rain engulfed him, causing him to hasten his retreat. With a nearby lightning strike, he took his cue and ran to be with her. Wow, that was close, he said, panting and rubbing his jeans. Before he knew it, she had climbed upon a little outstretching of rock. Do you think it will last long? she asked, with a look of concern on her face. Nah, he replied. Besides, if it does, we'll be safe in here. This old cave has seen more bad weather than you and I have ever witnessed. She moved in close to the wall. Here and there names of former visitors, which could hardly be made out, were carved into the rock's face. Remember when we were kids, she asked, and we used to come down here after school. Yeah, those were good times. It doesn't seem that long ago, she replied. No, I guess it doesn't. Do you believe those stories about this cave being haunted? A smirk came across his face. Yeah, I believe them. In fact, I know it is. Oh, don't do that. What? Don't scare me like that. Why? You didn't believe them, he asked, poking her in the arm. No, and you shouldn't either. Well, believe what you want. But when I was thirteen, Billy Johnson and I came down here one night to search for fishing worms under the rocks. We were no more than thirty feet from the back when we heard the sound of men talking and the only people in here was us. Oh, stop it now. That's a lie. It's the truth. There were people talking back there. He lifted his arm and pointed toward the back of the cave. She looked and put her head down. Mixed with the sound of the falling rain, he could hear her crying. Come on now. I'm just playing. There ain't no ghost in here. It's not that, she said softly. Then what is it? You don't know, do you? Know what? Sammy's dead, John. The war took him. Stunned, he plopped down beside her. I'm sorry, Gloria. I didn't know. It was never his intention to make her upset or reflect on the years prior. Even though he had grown up in the little town next to the Ohio, he had been gone so long that he was now classified as a stranger. At the time he left home, everyone was suffering the ill effects of undiscriminating poverty, and for many, his leaving was considered a turning away from the real problems of home. This was what he pondered most, what people thought about him. He knew it shouldn't matter, but he couldn't help it. What he did, by moving out west, was the best thing he could have done for himself and his family, even if that conviction was only his alone. You know, I sent them money. What? she asked, regaining her composure. I sent them money. I sent money to my mom and pa. That's what nobody understands. I come home, I visit people, but I'm treated like a stranger, as if something is wrong with me. Oh, nobody thinks that. They're happy to see you, especially me the most. 
He looked at her, her face glistening from the humidity. Outside, another thunderclap settled on the river. She smiled and put her face down. As though time had come to a halt, there was a stillness in the air between them. No words followed, no ceremony of utterances. He placed his finger to her chin and lifted it gently, giving her the feeling of being beckoned. The smile on her face softened. Looking at her, he was overcome with the moment and leaned in to give her a kiss. But she pulled away. Her action caused a hard, sharp jab to inflame his chest. I didn't want this to happen, she whispered, looking at him with honesty. She stood up and walked to the opening of the cave. Quickly following her, he placed his hands on her shoulders. Hey, I'm sorry. I won't do it again, at least not so soon. She turned around and looked at him, her cheeks now red from crying. I don't think you understand. Didn't anyone tell you anything when you were in California? Tell me what? I'm married now. Married, he questioned. To whom? Ben Sappleton. The man she mentioned had been an old friend of his. But something was wrong. Ben wasn't the kind of kid, you would think, who could marry a girl like her, a girl so young, vibrant, and full of life. The thought was almost too much. He left her and walked back out into the rain. Where are you going, she asked. Back home, he shouted. Wait, don't leave. She ran out of the cave and stopped in his path causing him to move around her. Please, don't be angry. I never meant to hurt. No, he said, interrupting. I guess you didn't. But you didn't put much thought into it either. Walking on, he left her standing there. The rain was now pouring heavily, soaking her dress and making her hair flatten into a thin veil of dirty yellow. How can I make you understand, she yelled. I never meant to. He paused and looked up. The storm clouds had now converged into a solid wall of white. Behind him, he could hear her crying. Why, Gloria? Why did you do it? He asked calmly. Ben was here. You were there. No, he said, reapplying the question. Why did you come to me when I came home? Why did you do this today? He turned back around to see her kneeling on the ground, propped by the heels of her shoes. She pushed her hair back behind her neck and squeezed the water from her drenched locks. What would you have said if I asked you and you knew? Moments passed, but he said nothing. Exactly. You would have run away from me like you did years ago. But I had to. Don't you understand? I had to leave to make money. She smiled and shook her head. Yes, I understand. All right. You left because you wanted to. He placed his hands on his hips and turned toward the river. Gloria, you have it all wrong. I No, she shouted. I don't have it all wrong. You have it all wrong. Do you know how bad I felt when you left? Do you know what it felt like to visit a neighbor's home? To hear a mother cry and moan because her son was killed in some tiny town thousands of miles away? And to see the men toiling in the fields alone, all the while knowing their sons were being slaughtered? Each time we had a knock on the door, I knew it was going to be news that you had left, gone to fight, never to return. But that's not why I left. I had to leave to make money. She stood up and ran to him. Listen to me, she screamed. Do you know how lucky you are? Go to the cemetery sometime. Look at the little flags. Stop by Betty Richardson's house and ask her about Samuel. Samuel? What happened? He questioned. A thin stream of fluid ran from her nose as he watched her gather up the basket. Clenching the handles tightly, she pushed him out of the way as she started toward home. 
Hey, what about Samuel? He asked again. Go to the cemetery. Have a look for yourself, she replied. See what you missed while you were gone to the big city. That night, he couldn't sleep. He paced the floor of his parents' home in search of solace. But it never came. His mind was racing with thoughts, mainly the one she had left with him. Morning finally came. Gathering up the courage, climbed into his father's truck at dawn and drove to the little cemetery on the outskirts of town. It wasn't a well-known cemetery, but it had two hundred years of history resting within the shallows of its soil. Walking past the little wooden gate that separated the uncut grass from the cut, he made his way slowly past headstones that he hadn't seen in years. Names spoke out to him as he made his way to a small group of flags that stood in a far corner of the cemetery. Reaching the spot, he saw a wooden sign created out of the love of a community that remembered its fallen. It read, In the memory of our children, Bill Johnson, Sam Richardson, and Clyde Miller, may their dreams be answered as they spend this day with the Lord. Reading the words, he bowed his head, and all he could do was cry. The End Back Home, written by Brooks Kohler, published by Brooks Kohler in 2022 for the purpose of adding the story to the Internet Archive, originally published in 2003 by Senior Views, a magazine based in Anna, Illinois.